Hey, everybody, back again on the uh, Agent Boost podcast. We're keeping them going here in the new year. I uh, got our temporary setup here running at the uh, the new office. Yeah, we look like we're set up in the school classroom <laughs> or something and, temporarily. Uh, yeah, so anyways, we're but again, we're we're keeping these episodes coming every week. We ran into some snags this week, but we're going to power through it. And we're actually really excited. Um, we have some special guests with us today. And uh, I'll pass. go ahead and give yourselves introductions. Okay. Yeah, so I'm Scott Morris. I'm the Director of Growth for Optum in Utah, Idaho, New Mexico, and Colorado. And I'm Scott Nguyen. I'm a new physician at Optum here in Utah. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're excited Perfect. to have you guys as as guests. We're, we're trying to mix up the content, of course. And, you know, as we've been talking for, for what we do in the industry, there's just so many different inner working parts and synergies between you know, obviously physicians and Optum and clinics and what our brokers and insurance agents do, um, you know, we really like the idea of bringing in more guests to kind of pull all those pieces together. You know? Yeah. First of all, Scott, maybe you could kind of give us a brief explanation of what Optum is, yeah. uh, because I think a lot of brokers are familiar with the name. Maybe they even know that it's owned by UHG, but uh, give us a as detailed but yeah, brief description of what <laughs> okay. of what Optum does. I'll do my best. So, so Optum, yeah, like you said, it falls under the UHC umbrella, um, and UHC is our sister company on the the care or the uh, benefit side, right? When it comes to plans, and we are the there's three there's different segments of Optum. Uh, we're on the care delivery side, so we're a, uh, called a CDO, a care delivery organization, um, and we work directly with physicians um, on quality of care. Um, really trying to drive that right care, the right time, right, right price, um, you know, for patients and for members. And, and, and uh, in Utah, we, we manage the Medicare Advantage lives in Northern Utah for United Healthcare. Perfect. And I would, I would add to that too. So Optum has a lot of even different divisions within Optum. Mm-hmm. I mean, Optum does everything yes. from being a PBM and, you know, doing those price negotiations on medications and delivery to, risk management to um, even network contracting. I mean, for, for people listening, when, hey, Dr. So-and-so in Nebraska is not in the network. I mean, it's, it's Optum, you know, that's actually going out to the market, contracting and bringing yeah. those providers in so that they're par. And again, going back to utilization management, there's all these different segments to the business that Optum does. Right, 100%. And, and part of that is our, our value-based emphasis, So our shared risk agreements, shared savings agreements that we do with these physicians, um, and that incentivizes quality over quantity, right? We're really trying to drive that incentive of, you know, if I spend the time with my patient, address those chronic conditions, um, get them that care plan, and and we provide those tools to help them do that. We have attestation forms, they're kind of like a checklist that show all their chronic conditions that they can kind of, as they're kind of check off and and address, Um, Anyway, because our, our focus is the is the patient and making their lives better. So one one question I've I always wondered early in my career was then how does Optum make money? Yeah, yeah. So we so we we take on that risk from the the payer. Huh? So the payer says, okay, you know, you get a certain set amount to take care of this the, these patients, um, and I'll see all that money comes in from CMS, right? Mm-hmm. And a chunk, you know, part of that also comes from star ratings, mm-hmm. RAF scores. There's all sorts of things that, that come into play um, on the amount of funding. Risk adjustment factor yep, for yep, those yep, exactly. listening. We use all these acronyms all yeah, the time. Yeah. 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 So, but yeah. So, and then, you know, through the, our payer contracts, that's how, you know, how we're getting, we're getting paid. Um, and sharing like a, like a per member per month type. Yeah. Type. And, and just for clarity too, for, for people who have listened to prior episodes, I mean, we've had even like Jill Serrani come on episodes mm-hmm. with their IE snip and, you know, you might hear five or six or seven other podcast episodes with Optum and it's going to be a different guest, but it's literally a completely different segment of the business or the role that they're handling. So we're just trying to convey out there what a large organization that Optum is, which I'm sure we're going to be talking about, you know, and how that factored into your decision-making process and, and everything else, but um, a whole lot to unpack there with Optum. Right. And then, so does Optum only work with United Health Care, or do they work with other organizations as well? They work with others too. So in Utah, um, we are only you know with UHC. They're our sister company. We all, we'll always work with UHC no matter yeah. what market we're in because of that relationship. Um, but other markets, we do work with other payers and manage those lives too. So I'm over in New Mexico as well. In New Mexico, we have four payers. 
you know, so we, we manage those lives on behalf of those, those pairs. So, so, so other carriers for the, a lot of the brokers out there yep, will yep. work with them as well yep. too. So, yeah. Perfect. So, and you guys are always looking to add that it's all very situational per market and per state. And sometimes yes. I, I know you do have relationships with Anthem or Elevance in some states and you have Humana and others, mm-hmm. and it really just depends on the market, but people don't even realize sometimes when an insurance agent sells a Elevance or Humana product, when they go and access care at the doctor, Optum's behind the scene managing that right. life and the and that that risk, right? You exactly know, behind the scenes. Yeah, so. and that, speaking behind the scenes, I mean, so behind the scenes, like you said, we have a lot of uh, teams and programs. We have our our case management teams, our pharmacy teams, all these things that are tracking those members um, because every member or patient, depending on their conditions, will fall into certain measures of quality. And I think you guys probably talk about quality measures, things like that before in your podcast. But, um, and we track that. Um, you know, if somebody goes to the hospital and they're discharged, we want to make sure that we follow up because if they get, you know, on medications, they go to the hospital, get new medications, and they come home, and they have both, maybe they take them all, or they don't take any. Some interactions there. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. It could be really bad, right? And so we, we'd really manage that to make sure that, that they're getting the right medications, their physician knows, the primary care doctor knows that they were in the hospital and now been discharged um, because we want to, you, know, you know, it could be really bad. And we, and we have many instances where we've saved many lives by just that process alone. So, yeah, really critical. Well, let's, um, let's change the topic a little bit about that. You were already mentioning one situation in, in care, and that is, you know, multiple prescribers and drug interactions and everything else. But let's start talking to you. Um, Dr. Wynn here a little bit and start talking yeah. about Optum. I want to clarify, sometimes mm-hmm. Optum has, you know, independent agents or, or, excuse me, independent physicians. They're part of an IPA group or they're part of other groups, um, but actually some physicians are actually employed by Optum. And so there's a little bit of a distinction there between employed physicians and just contracted physicians, correct? Yes, that is correct. And actually Optum is the biggest employer of physician in the country. Yep by the amount of physician that they employ. Wow. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, yes, I'm an uh, Optum employee physician. I'm not an independent physician who work with Optum. And so in that setting. Mm-hmm. So wh- why don't we back up a little bit, and why don't you tell us uh, why you wanted to become a doctor in the first place and kind of your journey into, uh, you know, becoming a doctor and then ending up with, with Optum? Yeah, I mean, I think it's... I don't know if it's an interesting story, but there's definitely been a story for me to leading up here where I am with Optum. So I was born overseas in Vietnam, and I moved to the United States with my family when I was young. And then I've been to, I, we moved to Utah, and I've been in Utah ever since. So in the process of moving here, I think one of the biggest influence on why I decided to go into medicine was just my experience with the medical system here when I first moved to the United States. And so I remember one of the first really true experience I had with the medical system was taking my grandpa to a community health clinic down in Ogden, which is originally where we were settling at that time when we first moved to America. And that was such a a unique experience because it's completely different than what the healthcare system is Oh, and, and all was in Vietnam, mm-hmm. for which I experienced for many years when I was living there. And really to see the you know, the aspect of taking care of people, taking care of patients who underserve, who don't speak the language, and building this connection with, with patient, I think it's very unique to the American medical system. I think... The healthcare system that we have here is not perfect by any mm-hmm. means, but I think there are a lot of positives in in the way that we do medical care here in our country. And really, I think unless you experience a different medical system in a different country, you won't really truly appreciate the good things that we do here. And so being exposed to a completely different medical system in my hometown Vietnam and then move to America and then experience another one I really s- see this difference and really appreciate it and it really sparked my interest in being a doctor. yeah that's a that's a good point I think uh you know very often Americans do take advantage 
or, or take, for take for granted our, our system and actually how, how good it is in general, especially compared to some some other countries. And Dan and I have both experienced uh, the healthcare systems of, of other countries. Uh, you know, I lived in Portugal for a while, and when no matter what happened to you, you got some iodine on it. <laughs> on it, and uh, and and by the, and for the record, I don't recommend the Red Cross Hospital in Mexico. Yeah. Out of nowhere. <laughs> It's not highly recommended. They did not get five stars. <laughs> yep, absolutely. So that kind of was your your origin story. Is you you noticed the difference of the care and taking yeah. your grandpa there and kind of sparked that in in you. Um, so talk about why do you think that we're kind of going through a doctor shortage these days? Right? There's there's m- much less people getting into the healthcare industry from your perspective, and you know going through that fairly recently. Why do you feel like? there's less people getting involved, less people wanting to be doctors these days. You know, uh, I don't know if there is less, well, there are less people wanting to be doctors, more so that there is a bottleneck in the process of training doctors. Mm-hmm. I think, to be perfectly honest with you, I think getting into medical school has become insanely competitive over the years. I think it's way more competitive now than it has ever been at any point in the past, in the past. And that kind of speak to the interest of people wanting to become physician or medical providers. I think the problem that we have in our country, specifically the process of training doctors and producing doctors to serve the people in our communities really come down to, the residency training process. Mm-hmm. And this come back to a regulation and a law that was passed many, many years ago where they cap the amount of residency slot that will be funded by Medicare. Mm. And so this create a bottleneck where no matter how much increase in the size of medical school we, we try to do, it won't matter because there are only so many spots that this student can go into to train to become a fully licensed physician. And for those who don't know, you will get your MD after you graduated from medical school, but that MD really doesn't mean a whole lot unless you complete residency training. And so residency training is really when you earn your stripe to become a fully licensed physician. And you can only practice after you complete residency. And so because of this process, we're really looking at a bottleneck where we have this cap many, many years ago where our population was not the same side that it is now. Mm -hmm. Correct. And so the demand is not being quite met by the production that we have. And so I think that's where the problem is. Interesting. And so we only, and we're also looking at a large population of baby boomer physician retiring in the mm-hmm. next 10 years. I think I was reading this one survey done by Medscape. I don't know if you heard of the, the website or the company, but one of the things that they were doing a survey on is the age of family medicine physician. And mind you, uh, being a PCP in the center of primary care physician in our country, you can be a pediatrician, you can be an internal medicine physician, or you can be a family medicine physician. So those three group of specialty can be considered a, a primary care physician. Mm-hmm. And so this survey was specifically only looking at family medicine physician, but for the demographic, I think about close to 20% of the current practicing physician within our specialty, within my specialty, family medicine, is between the age of 60 and 70. Wow. wow. And so 20%, and you're looking at something that would be really a significant change in the next 10 years when this 20% of physicians retire. And that will put an even bigger strain on the system in terms of having access to care and having access to a physician who can understand your condition and kind of de- develop the relationship with you at your primary care. Yeah, and I, I would add to that too. So we had a brief conversation even at lunch and we were talking about that to where there are some states where if you look at the landscape, there's 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 plenty of what seems like access to care at the moment in some of those states. But nonetheless, like you pointed to, there's going to be so many physicians that are retiring mm-hmm. as that population is growing, it's going to create these a shortage in the supply for the demand. Mm-hmm. And there's already states who are in 
really precarious situations already that are right. like some of our listeners are in states like California and they're in places like New Mexico, like we or talked rural about, areas, or, yeah. where, you know, some of these people, they, they just want to be seen and they're sometimes waiting months just to even get into a PCP. And we try to explain to insurance agents all over the country that these marketplaces are very unique and different on every state. And, you know, some states, people aren't very picky about their physicians. They just want to be able to see somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think eventually over these next five or 10 years, we're going to get there where as a country, that access to care becomes more increasingly difficult, I would imagine. Yeah, I think that's been something that I've even noticed over the course of our career as, as agents and brokers. It used to be you would meet a client and they would be dead set on sticking with one doctor that had been, you know, their family doctor and then their parents doctor. And it was like, I have to see this person no matter what. And that's really shifted more and more and more. And then even coming through COVID, I think people, I don't want to call it less loyal, but they're just, they're almost just more grateful to be seen and rather than have, it's, it's more becoming more rare to see somebody that's had these lifelong I only am going to see this one doctor, you know? Yeah, we were talking about that actually too. And I think that segues very nicely into, you know, two components is really the discussion that we probably should have of the difference between fee-for-service care and value-based care and how that experience is different from the clinical side and the approach to it and also the experience for, for the member as well, right? So, yep. um, and I don't know if, if who wants to respond to the question, Scott or, you know, Dr. Wynn, but... Um, you know, let's, we should probably for listeners explain the difference in fee for service versus value based yeah. care, right? I can, yeah, I can, I can yeah. take that. So, I mean, the regular, you know, fee for service model, um, make sure I'm close enough to this. Um, they, uh, you know, it's the doctors want you to come in, they need to make a quick appointments. They have to, mm -hmm. you know, so many appointments that they hit every day in order to cover that overhead, right? So, if it's just they're submitting CPT codes and billing for those services with no additional incentives tied, I mean, it's just kind of a, I, I call it like a churn and burn yeah. Yeah. model. And, and yeah, just so everybody knows, there's a set fee, yeah. a reimbursement rate for yeah. those CPT codes yeah. that is set and fixed. And so, so, and, so, it, so and you got to clarify point. people, we call it fee for service, meaning yep. that a doctor's performing a yep. service and they charge a fee for that service. So yep. traditionally or historically, that's what would happen, right? I mean, a right. patient comes in. They get seen, and let's see, there's maybe five or six different bill, CPT or billing codes. Maybe you're like your general office visit level one mm -hmm. with this diagnostic, you know, test that was ran mm -hmm. and some blood work or something, and they submit nine CPT codes to the insurance company. Right, right. right. That's traditional fee-for-service. So if right. patients aren't coming in, and I'm bringing up COVID in particular because we had a lot of physicians that did not want to do value-based care. They didn't want to contract with these insurance companies. And suddenly, you know, in these COVID years, when people weren't going to the doctor and accessing care, these physicians, these clinics, they were just dying on yeah. the line because people weren't going in. They couldn't bill, and they're still having all this overhead. So. Well, another big thing too is generally in the in the past, and Medicare rates are generally less anyway. Yeah, correct. You know, and so a lot, a lot of physicians were like, "I don't want to take Medicare because I won't make anything on and Medicare. Medicaid even less." And yeah. Medicaid even <laughs> yes, exactly. I used to work the Medicaid side too. Yeah. That's just pro bono. Yeah, yeah. pretty much, pretty <laughs> yeah. much. And some are actually do pro bono, but but um, but that's when when you tie incentives to quality, that's when the physicians actually because you know again we talk to physicians, it's not all it's not about money. Right, they're there, you know, to take care of the patients, but money is a factor. You have to have the dollars coming in to support your your clinic. You want to live a good life too, right? It's why, you know, um, and so through these incentives, as they hit these quality measures and do these things, they can make considerably above Medicare rates, and by doing the right thing, and they're probably doing it across the board for all payers anyway. So get on these in, these incentive programs. The, those extra funds come in to add additional staff, add additional programs to help continue to manage those patients um, and to improve the practice and make it even even better. Yeah. And for further and for further context, what Scott's referring to is that, you know, rather than just having this model where someone has to come into the doctor in order for them to see them and they're forced to build these codes in order to make revenue and keep the lights on, so to speak, they're really saying, hey, here's a panel or a group of lives that you're responsible to manage. And we want you to do certain things to keep these people healthy and provide good outcomes. So 
initiatives like it, for example, are making sure they're doing a, like a routine annual physical, mm -hmm. some preventive screenings, um, which I'm sure I'm going to be asking you about a lot of these metrics in a minute. But, um, you know, and you're, you're paid for reducing hospital admissions. I mean, exactly. these are all yes. good things, right? Like we would all agree that if a doctor is paying attention and actually kind of babysitting and taking care of his panel and reducing those hospital admissions, we all agree that that's a win. That's a positive thing. Yeah, the analogy I used to use is let's say you've got a doctor and, and this doctor traditionally uh, were like independent they had a practice they had they had staff that they had to cover they had their house payment and their car payment and their boat payment well if you're getting fee for service payments how do you make more money well you you see more patients right so it's a set fixed code so you see there and and the the focus isn't on the quality of care it's on volume. being volume and billing the right. most and the value based care model is a smart thing that's like we talked about our healthcare system it's a move to initiative that compensates doctors um, to be able to spend that necessary time and be outcome focused versus transactional focused. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of the way you see that, Dr. Wynn? Yeah, I would agree for the most part. I think definitely a lot of the things that you guys say are my, my share opinion as well. I think in terms of a provider perspective, for me as a physician, I think these incentive program, which really took off in the last few years, um, I think changed the landscape a lot more for primary care, more so than a lot of different specialty, to be honest with you. And as a primary care physician, I think I, I really appreciate this incentive program because really just a few years ago, like I, like I mentioned before, this incentive program become more well-known and be more, more well-accepted. It's, it's difficult. It was difficult to do the right thing a lot of time. It was difficult to get the patient to do the annual wellness visit or trying to call and coordinate care between different specialists or trying to schedule a follow-up of the hospital stay or trying to keep in touch with um, the screening and the preventive measures. All of this thing takes effort, takes time, takes staff, and takes people mm -hmm. to perform and a lot of the time you don't really have this additional funds to do this thing mm -hmm. and so it was a thing being in training prior to this incentive program being more well known and accepted like they are now i can see the benefit that they really create for patient over the last few years and i think the physician appreciated too specifically primary care physician because again Back to Scott's point and your guys' point, really is that a lot of physicians, primary care physicians, are getting paid to do the right things, which to me is a win-win situation for everyone involved, the patient, the staff, the physician, and the community as a whole. Because at the, I think we are at a time where everybody have the same goal, mm -hmm. uh, and are incentivized to achieve the same goal, which I don't think has happened in the past before when we have the fee-for-service model. Yeah, the, the value-based care model is, is one that Dan and I like. It's one of the reasons why we've become such a, a big fan of, of Medicare Advantage and then kind of the shifts in, in ACA macro that, you know, po post-macro that have kind of come into the plays because when it works – you know, it's everything's not a perfect world, but right. it is a shift conceptually to driving healthcare costs down, to delivering care when and where it's needed to, and and focusing on those outcomes. Because at the end of the day, the it's a focus on lives, and if we can manage conditions early, if we can you know get people in and doing their their preventive measures, then overall it drives usage down, utilization down, hospital rates. You know, if you can prevent a few heart attacks or chronic conditions. You're, you're driving the costs overall of the healthcare system and the utilization down immensely. But at the end of it, those are human beings. Exactly. Those are, those are yep. lives, you know, yep. those are better health outcomes. Yeah. Yep. And, and we kind of talked about it, at, at, you know, prior a little bit too, but one of the things that we probably want to spend a little bit of time talking about as well is just even your own particular practice and how, you know, the approach that you would maybe like, first of all, the experience with the patients and, what that looks like from your clinic versus somewhere else. How does yeah. that differ? And then also, you know, just the idea, like I use that broad term functional medicine, like we, mm -hmm. we were talking about, and yeah. that's like a whole 
thing to unwind and unpack, but, but just maybe the approach of you being a newer physician versus maybe a physician that was trained 20, 30, 40 years ago in medical school sure. and, and how that might be a different experience from your patients from a physician that's been in practice and is 71 years old right now. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say in my opinion, I think uh, there are a lot of differences between a younger physician and a physician who've been practicing for a long time. But to go back to the initial point that you were making, what is the difference between the clinic that I'm working at right now and the other clinic that are around the valley, specifically the Salt Lake Valley? I think, so my clinic is part of Optum Care system here in Utah, which is relatively new compared to a lot of the healthcare system that have been here for many years. Mm -hmm. um, our clinic really, I think, try to focus on the same models and the same goals that Optum as a whole organization has, which is at the end of the day, we try to make our patient life better and try to create quality of life for our patient in whatever way that we can. And I think that go back to us being a, being an organization that started out as an incentivized um, um, a, pro, a, a company to focus on incentivize physician and healthcare providers to do the right thing and to do the thing that we know matters for a patient. And that transition into our, our care clinic as well, our clinical setting where I, as an, an optimum employed physician, really, I have the luxury of time that is allotted to me to really get to know my patient, to get to know them not just as a patient, but as a human being, like you guys say, try to develop the relationship with my patient and kind of get to know them. I think we can all agree that we feel more comfortable with medical care providers who actually try to get to know us and who mm -hmm. understand what our needs and what our challenges and obstacles are in achieving the life that we want in terms of our health status. I think... Working for Optum and working for my clinic right now, I can see that because, again, often time, we really try our best to do what is right for patient. An example would be I have the luxury of having a 40-minute appointment time with a brand-new patient. I think this is very unusual anywhere mm -hmm. else. I mean, not to name name, but a lot of the big organization here in the Valley and in Utah in general, most physicians get a 15-minute visit yep. you mean five I, minutes yeah. <laughs> or that yep and 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 this is just it's not just utah it's everywhere throughout the yeah, country right, right right it's it's i mentioned it in a more of a cynical manner but mm -hmm. you know that it's often that the doctor walks into the room right and i joke that you feel like you're being punished in like a cell <laughs> waiting there in prison yep. and then the doctor comes in and is like hey how do you feel <laughs> okay and they start typing something on the keyboard really quick and then okay do you have any questions for me like no, um, am I healthy? Yeah, okay. And you kind of just, you're, <laughs> and it's like three minutes, five yeah. minutes, and you're out. Yeah. And that, that doctor just, it's volume, and they're just doing lots of it. And I think right. that's, most people are probably kind of used to that kind mm -hmm. of an interaction with the doctor, right. I, I think. Yeah. And I think, so that's part of the reason that we wanted you to be a, a guest on here and talk about that, because it is something that a lot of people are not used to, is to think about spending 40 minutes or 30 minutes with a primary doctor and having that interaction, that's not something that people are used to. Yeah. What does an initial visit of 40 minutes look like? What kind of measures are you able to do and care are you able to do? Yeah. I think this depend on the patient. Obviously it's very different if you have a 45 year old who's healthy, who doesn't have any chronic condition versus a 70 years old who's a, a Medicare Advantage patient who coming in and have potentially a long list of chronic condition. Those are very different visit by themselves. But I think for us, um, as for my clinic, and I think for Optum as a whole, I think the initial visit for any new patient, our goal really is just to try to get to know you. I, And for me, my, my role as primary care physician is to understand what are the patient current health status is like and who are they as a person. What are the challenges in their life? What are the obstacles that they face? And what are the things that I can do to help them improve their health? I think a lot of the time I spend my time on the first in initial visit really just trying to get to know the patient and 
ask them what do they need from me. I think mm -hmm. identify what do they want from the physician from the initial meeting is very important because then I can try to be a person who they trust that will always have the best interests in mind. Love it. No, I, I, I really do appreciate that. And it is, like I said, it's it's very unique, right? That care experience. And I think that's what we're we're trying to say, we're, we're trying to change that model of healthcare. And you kind of mentioned prior to like, boy, it's like really picked up over these last couple of years. And I would point to like MACRA as being this huge piece of legislation years ago that, mm -hmm. that changed that funding landscape. In our industry, brokers were talking about how you couldn't sell Plan F Medicare supplements anymore. And I'm like, that's like a tiny microcosm. This was like groundbreaking legislation that completely changed the funding landscape for physicians and it's changing healthcare. And it was huge. And I think there was a very big lack of understanding of what that really was. And so to your point, things have very much changed. And hopefully the goal is that things continue to shift to that model where we're looking at outcomes, we're spending time with people, we're preventing, you know, any of those major health issues. And, and even, you know, I think what I appreciate about our conversation too was the idea of you being a younger physician that just graduated mm -hmm. and how you're more open to whether it's homeopathic treatments for some things or other types like we use the illustration of the thing of, of acupuncture or other Eastern medicine for, yeah well just some things versus you know um, I think a lot of older school physicians who've been around for a lot of years mm -hmm. they're just very regimented in, in if there's this condition or patient I do this and it's a very set rigid treatment plan and there's not multiple approaches or a thought process to how to treat that condition yeah, I, I would say I would say that's definitely true to that, and I think I share that opinion as well. I think, I mean, outside of medical knowledge, which I think is a case by case basis when you're comparing between doctors, but also it's the culture of training, the culture of community, and the culture of our country as a whole that really changed in the past couple of decades. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are a lot of things that would be difficult for physician or just any medical providers who were in a very different environment, who were trained in a very different setting and environment in the past to adapt to. And for me, I think most younger physicians, including myself, are more comfortable with what I call the gray area of medicine. Mm -hmm. I think medicine, as we all know, has advanced significantly in the past few decades. We are able to treat things that we were not able to treat in the past. We are able to cure things that we were not able to cure in the past. Examples such as hepatitis C, which is used to be something that we could not cure. We mm -hmm. can completely get rid of hepatitis C nowadays with medication, which I think speak to the advanced advancement that we have made within the field of medicine. But for me, I think what I really see that could be a big difference between different generation of physician is really the idea of that we don't quite know a lot of things that are out there that could help our patient. Mm -hmm. And that's most of the time, there are not a definitive right or wrong answers in any situation. And I think this is... Uh, culture shift as well when I was going through training I think one of the most spoken concept of the most taught concept that we were constantly being bombarded with during our training when I was going through medical school and residency is shared decision, shared decision making mm -hmm. basically my role as a physician now is not to tell the patient what to do my role as a physician now is to speak to my patient and present to them what I think could be possible and what are the options and guide them to make a decision that would best fit their needs. And so it's a very different role that being emphasized now in the process of training physician and physician who are younger now are more readily accept this kind of role where I really is just an advisor to my patient. I'm not somebody who will tell you, you need to do this, you need to do that. I'm really somebody who's here to get to know you and really give you my professional opinion on what are the best thing to do for you, for you to improve your health, but also to really involve you with the decision making and take into consideration what are the best thing for you, 
what might be the obstacle for you to achieve certain things and how can we go about that and so i think is it is it kind of this basic of a conversation? And, and I'm the more you get to know me, you know, I'm a little bit sarcastic. Mm-hmm. And is it kind of like this where it's, hey, Dan, um, you're kind of overweight and you're not obese yet, but you have a couple <laughs> options here. Either you can eat better and exercise and like and get better sleep and be healthy mm-hmm. or in the next couple of years you know, your lipids and your blood pressure and all these things yeah. are going to get worse. And then I'm just going to have to treat with medication. He's doctoring himself. And then if we don't yeah. do that, then you mm-hmm. run the risk of like heart disease or <laughs> y- y- is that kind of like how that conversation goes? Kind of. <laughs> I, 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 I won't put it that bluntly. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, a, a perfect example, and you brought up the perfect example, it's just obesity. For example, yeah. if a patient come in and have weight concern, you know, what are the conversations that I would have? And I think, I would say really, I was trained to approach, again, patient on an individual basis. And as you get to know your patient, you get to know how they would respond to certain phrase, to certain wording, and to certain communication style. Yeah. So for some patient, I have patient who I get, as I get to know them, I, I know that they are, a straight shooter kind of people. Yeah. And they prefer me to tell them exactly my thought and my objective uh, recommendation and what I think is are the best thing for them to do. And so for those patients of mine, I just tell them, hey, you need to lose weight. I think you are significantly overweight and you are at a significant risk of getting stroke, heart disease, diabetes, you have higher risk of cancers. These are all the things that will significantly decrease your quality of life or may even kill you before you reach the age of 70 or 65. And so that might be the conversation that I have with those type of patients of mine where I have patients who really prefer me to approach the conversation in, in a different manner. And so there are patients who prefer me to kind of gently guide them into what I think would be our approach. Yeah, they may have mental and emotional health issues that are playing right. into this, and that's yeah. not going to... Right. You could shoot them straight, but that's not going to help not gonna them work. or that and time. As, mm-hmm. Actually, it might do more harm exactly. for the patient because yeah. they might react to it very negatively, and they think that what I'm telling them really is trying to punish them, I yeah. think. So really, I was trained, and again, I think this is the shift in the culture of training physician for the past decade is that we really approach a patient on an individual basis and we know that we need to be considerate in terms of the patient culture, in terms of the patient background, in terms of their social economic factors. There are a lot of different things that affect patient care, not just the pure objective medicine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I know that you have you know, certain objectives that, that you need to complete, like as a physician or, or things that are very much a priority. Like I talked about one, like I'm sure Mm -hmm. like a routine annual physical is probably one of those key objectives that you want to do with all your patients probably, right? And then for for men, I'm guessing colorectal screenings or something for some of them, or for women, it's mammograms. What are kind of some of those key things that as a practitioner and as a physician, what are those things that are crucial or critical that you're always trying to make sure that everybody has that completed? Yeah, I think for me, any patient who come in for an annual wellness visit or for a preventive visit, if they are not really a Medicare patient, Mm -hmm. what I try to do is we always try to do everything based on evidence. And so my visit is centered around doing the preventive measure, talking about preventive testing and proactive approach on things that have been proven to matter for patient care. So for your point, colorectal uh, screening, huge. Something that we know for a fact that improve mortality and mobility of any patient who adhere to the guideline of screening. And so for those tests and measures, I focus a lot of my time during the visit on those things just because I know it making they are the thing that make a difference for a patient. And for women, like you mentioned, mammogram, but really... For the visit itself, it's just we're trying to capture what can we do for this patient who's sitting in front of me that has been that have been proven to improve their life. Mm-hmm. That really is the objective that I have in my mind for any patient who sit in front of me for any preventive visit. And so 
I'm I'm a pretty avid fan of learning about preventive measure and preventive testing and, and things that are really making a difference for patient care. And a big thing is the USPFTF, which is a very long acronym for US Preventive Service Task Force screening. We have a task force for that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and a task force for everything. That's right. Yeah. And I think a lot of people who are not involved in medicine might not know, for example, for the people who might be listening to pod, for this podcast, which is mostly insurance agent, uh-huh. that really this organization are the people who create screening guidelines that Medicare will eventually accept. It. So Medicare based what preventive screening measure they cover in their plan based on the recommendation most of the time of this organization. And so whatever this organization decides is appropriate for screening will eventually get approved by Medicare, which in turn will eventually get approved by other insurance because other insurance usually follow the recommendation or the thing that approve or cover under Medicare in terms of preventive services. So I really try to focus on the specific guideline that being created by this organization and task force because again i know that they really are really strict on what they consider to be evidence-based right mm-hmm. um, really they don't really approve or recommend things that are not clear-cut like evidence. experimental yeah. or early or not proven. C- right. kind of to that point and, and this is just kind of maybe my own personal question but there's a lot of uh, influencer guidelines by HHS, Health and Human Services, and CMS these days, and and just the evolution of the healthcare industry mm-hmm. and physicians. There's been a lot of centralization and a movement away from less independent doctors and more, you know, typically employed physicians. Do you? I'm going to talk about that too. So yeah, how much? How much do you feel like you latitude you have as a doctor um, to kind of be your own, like you said, treat each. each patient holistically versus implementing the protocols that are kind of approved and set forth Mm -hmm. by these uh, government agencies? You know, that's a good question. I think, I think I can only speak for my, for my own experience. I think I still felt like I could make a lot of individualized care recommendation for my patient in my day-to-day practice. I, I do feel that a lot of the older physician feel differently, and but I cannot speak for them. I can only mm-hmm. speak from my own experience. But I think at the end of the day, I think this evolution in the way that we approach medicine and patient care, to be honest with you, I, I think we, as far as preventive measure and as far as the incentive measure program that we're creating, I think we're heading in the right direction. I think a lot of time, there are situations where this guideline might not be the best for the patient, but I think they are the minority, not the majority. I think as a whole, the majority of the time, this guideline, this incentive measure program that we have, actually have the same goal that I have as a doctor to take care of this condition. So for example, a big a big incentive measure is for a lot of primary care physicians or A1C target, mm-hmm. so blood sugar control. And so for those who don't know, A1C is really the main test that we use to assess how a patient who are diabetic is doing. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the incentive program have an A1C target. So maybe that's less than nine, maybe that's seven to eight. And it might be maybe you're on metformin exactly. or maybe depending you're insulin on, dependent. Yeah. 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 Or if, if you have um, kidney disease, then the, the goal might be different uh, and you might need to be on a certain agent. And so, but... Really, this 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 target and this goal are the exact same thing that I try to do for my patient. Mm-hmm. You know, I would love for my patient to get down to seven or eight A one C. I would love for them to take their metformin as prescribed and consistently. And so, really, I love of for t- them to diet and exercise before <laughs> that as well, right? <laughs> and uh, doing whatever they can to yeah. to improve their lifestyle. But I think I, I got, I'm I'm gonna be completely honest, and this is completely honest perspective for me is that I feel like most of the time my goals are exactly the same as these incentive measure goals are. That's good. And I, one of the things too, that we might kind of started that conversation we've already spoken about it is one thing that's different or unique about you is the fact that you're with Optum and you're mm-hmm. a part of Optum mm-hmm. and that that decision-making process to do it that way, because what people don't realize, and we talked about the medical system and, mm-hmm. and there's, critics and cynics and people who are positive and 
you know, there's many people who say that they're, they don't want, you know, all the private practice doctors coming into big groups or IPAs and M MSOs, all these different organizations that are forming um, conglomerates. And Optum is the largest employer of physicians throughout the country. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, what people don't realize is going through medical school and having all the student debt and then coming out of medical school and then trying to be an entrepreneur at that point where you have to go raise capital to then try to get a financier to give you money to start a practice and have all the expenses to run a practice and then your years and years and years to pay off medical debt and then more years to even make a profit from starting a practice and and then that person has to be an entrepreneur too, not just a doctor. They have to do marketing and have a marketing company. And how are the patients going to find out and, and get there? And then yeah. all the equipment that you need to buy to do that. And so one of the things that the counter to that, of course, is that with Optum, you have at your disposal so many more resources available to you that are out there. And then you get to spend your time focusing on the clinical side and spending time with your patient and being a doctor. So maybe maybe speak to that a little bit. That's that's maybe how Dan I answered it. for you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think he did. I <laughs> think the story. I think he totally yeah. did. I think I think Optin should pay yeah. me for doing. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he 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 explained it pretty well. I think I totally agree with with what um, or what to say. I think really it's the concept of private practice physicians straight out of medical school is almost extinct mm -hmm. for nowadays. Yeah, 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 nowadays for a variety of reason. I think. The main thing is really come down to the financial aspect of it. And again, there there are a lot of trade-offs that you have to make if you want to go the route of being in private practice, even if you're not fresh out of medical school or fresh out of training, anything like that. I think being part of Optum and being part of um, a big organization, there are definitive perks for sure working in this system think what I appreciate the most is really you you can focus on patient care like what Dan to say but another thing is really you have at your disposal really the resources that otherwise you would not you would not be able to have mm -hmm. I mean no private practice in the country I don't care how big you are can have the same amount of resource as Optum or UHG can offer mm -hmm. to a physician or a clinician that work for the organization. And this resource can make a big difference in a, in a patient quality of life and in the way that you approach patient care. And again, I think most, I, I would say the majority of physicians, really at the end of the day, we want to be able to take care of the patient to the best of our ability, the easiest way possible. Mm -hmm. And that sentence is a little bit of an oxymoron because yeah. it's difficult to do, to do that in that sense. And so I think working for Optum is really, has been able for me to fulfill that goal um, a lot better than otherwise would have been. Perfect. Well, I think we're kind of coming towards the end, but let's kind of maybe wrap this all up and bring it home. I, two, two thoughts. My thought was, what would you both, like, since we're talking to mostly insurance agents, what would, how can insurance agents set a better expectation or what would you like to see brokers do to make your life easier and thereby the patient experience better, whether that's expectations or, you know, health risk assessments? What is yeah. it? So I would say, first off, I mean, value-based care, it's the way everything's going. Educate yourself any way possible you can so that you can educate your client. Because when you're in that living room or whatever you're talking to them, they need to know, look, they're going to call you to come to your annual health visit each year. Mm -hmm. They're going to call you for mammograms. They're going to call you to do these things, right? Expect those calls. That's not to, like, harass you. It's, it's to make sure that you're getting that preventive care that you need to keep you out of the hospital, keep yep. you healthier, I say it as active versus reactive. It care, is. You know? It's proact proactive yeah. care. It's yeah. it's us trying to you know be on stay on top of it instead of the back end when they're in the hospital and then you know wait until the there's a problem and then exactly. Take care of it. And then the second thing too is especially if somebody's choosing a new physician. Let's say they're choosing you know Doctor Wynn. Try to help that your client make initial contact with that physician's office in some way, because a lot of times we run into is. A, a, a broker may put a name or choose a PCP and put on the application, 
but there's no contact there, and they never they won't go in. And so what it does is it causes abrasion on the physician's side because they're being graded on that patient, right? They want to get them in and take care of them, but also it, it comes down to also affects their incentives and things like that to help them improve their practice. And so if they're not going in, then and sometimes what happens too is the physician's office is calling that patient, hey, we need you to come in. They're like, who are you? Why are you calling me? Stop yeah. calling me. You know, and then if they don't go see them, then we have our third, you know, our teams in the back end that make those phone calls and the people get ticked off because we're making those phone calls now to get them in. You know, or see them in their home or, or whatever, or house calls and things like that, which, you know, I know a lot of people have complained about, but it's because, you know, they're not seeing seeing their, their physician. So that's what I would I would say. Yeah, how, that's one. How, how much easier would your lives be if our broker was in the home and they actually had a line to your office and said, hey, I yeah. got you a new patient, and like, hey, can I check the schedule? I want to get him in to see you, and book yep. that visit and teed it up and got it scheduled and done for you. You're yeah, right. I think a lot of times brokers are under the impression that once they choose that that primary care physician, their job's kind of done. But I always coach agents to really prepare the the client as well and say, yeah, they are going to reach out to you, and here's why. Right. And give them a basic explanation of value-based care and be like, look, do you want to be – no one loves to go – most people don't love to always be going to the doctor and getting all the preventive stuff done, but ultimately – you want, that's how you get a good outcome. You don't, you want to be healthy, you know? And that's kind of what I say is, well, then they're, they're just doing their job. They're trying to make sure that they're reaching out to you. They're getting you in the clinic. And it's been a big reason why Dan and I are such big fans of advantage plans too. And the value-based care model is we'll explain to people, you know, I, I want my parents, I want in an ecosystem where, yeah, someone is going to, cause my, I know how my dad is. He's going to be the guy that stubborn, stubborn yeah. that doesn't go to the doctor and he's, yep. he's not going to go until there's a problem. And I want him, I do want somebody besides my mom and me to be reaching out to him and being like, Hey buddy, you got to get in here and you got to do this, 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 yeah. and this, and they're going to catch stuff early. And, and ultimately it's, I care about you and I want you to get the care that you need. Yeah. And to your point, Dan, we, I would double check. We have had in the past that's direct, that direct line. Mm-hmm. to the clinic. So I'll, I'll make sure that um, if it's not so active, we get that back active and, yep. and get it out and maybe it's not, we can share it and things like that. Yeah. But, but it's, it's crucial. Well, and, and part of that is too, like when it's that broker that they have the relationship with, and it's like, sometimes they entered into their contacts. If the brokers call they're picking up the phone every time. Mm-hmm. If it's a number on the caller ID, they don't recognize and it's Dr. Wynn's office. And they're like, oh, I'm, not, I'm not answering that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it's, it's just different. I think there's ways that we talk about this and, and I, I could go out three hours talking about right. this with you all but i because i think there's so many opportunities to partner there so kind of same thing to kind of end is how can a broker be more involved and not even just of course with with dr win and and we certainly want everybody to know listening um to yeah if you have those patients here in the salt lake valley and they're looking for a physician i'm sure they can find a great home with with dr win who has a lot of time available to spend with those patients and deliver great quality of care we definitely want people to see you out there in uh, West Jordan, correct? Mm-hmm. Do you want to tell everybody where they can come see care? Yeah. My office is uh, in Taylorsville, Redwood Row. Uh, address is 6321 South Redwood Row. And again, I think, again, as a new physician in the area, I'm accepting new patients and can get them in yeah. most of the time in the same day if they need to be. Wow. wow. So. Which, is, which is great. I mean, so if you're listening and that's great and you, you know, somebody is, doesn't have a home as far as having a PCP, uh, obviously, you know, you're going to be a great fit. But the other thing just in general is how can a broker work with, I look at it and I've been helping brokers for years and understanding like the equation of working together with the consumer or the client, the, the doctor who's seen them and the broker, we all work together. And I think we have similar objectives. How can that broker get the foot in the door and provide value to a physician in their clinic? Yeah. So a lot, that's actually a lot of what I do, right. Is, mm-hmm. And with with these groups, with these physician groups, um, again, as I said in the past, they were hesitant to accept a lot of Medicare. That's shifting, right? With these incentive programs, they're able to to make more, a lot more than they used to. And so it's 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 continuing that that uh, interest in growing those those Medicare panels. Um, and so as we continue to contract with physicians, and we, I mean, heck, we we're contract with the majority of the PCPs in the valley, mm-hmm. anyway. So um, the uh, so what I do is I, as I 
you know, our network management team is they work with the physicians and start talking about growth and understanding their financials. The life physicians, they want to continue growing that. So I, I will be that kind of uh, that link between the, the broker and the physician group and get them in the door and come up with those kind of growth strategies and things like that with, with those, those contracted clinics. Um, so I'm always available to be, you know, people reach out to me as well. And I know you guys have my contact information. Um, if there's ever a clinic that a broker is like, hey, I'm interested, you know, let me know. And we can see if, you know, if they are interested in, in working with a broker. Because a lot of, they don't, because a lot of times when it comes to the, the, um, the physicians, they just don't, they don't understand the broker side of things. They don't understand yeah. where do the enrollments right. come from. They don't know, right? I mean, even the Medicare stuff, the staff, you know, they don't know the enrollment period. They don't know the ins and outs of, of what it takes to become a, a patient. Yep. Right, uh, a Medicare member, but, and so. But a lot of times, these physicians they want to grow their panel they with do. specific yeah. carriers and specific contracts, yep. and so there's really a big opportunity there, provider based marketing, where you can get in contact with us, you know, a Scott or his contemporary uh, across the country, yep. and really leverage that. In fact, that's a, a massive. Uh, underutilized opportunity that we're always hammering into our agents. Yeah, yeah. and I'll, I'll just I'll do, we we rarely self promote like on the pod, but I would say we we train agents all over the country. I always say there's you can get in the front door, you can get in the back door, right. you can get in through the window. <laughs> I mean, there's if you understand like the objectives of a clinic or a physician, and you really yeah. have a pretty good understanding of how it functions and their pain points and what they're trying to achieve. A lot of times, if you approach the practice manager and say like, yeah. hey. We've even to the point where we've tracked enrollments and gone to a physician and said, hey, I've actually done, you know, 152 enrollments and sent you these patients. Did you yeah. know I sent you those new patients? Oh, my. No, that's that's we, great. We didn't. Yeah. And then it's different to say, hey, I can actually do a whole lot more. I want to work as a partnership here and I can feed your practice and your panel and do this. There's a lot of training that we do to help our brokers to understand how they can be valuable and how everybody wins, because if they're involved in that relationship with the patient and it's connecting that with the physician, I think we can all work together again and achieve more and yeah. everybody wins. And I think too, is, 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 you know, as you approach clinics, it's, this is a value add that's not going to cost you anything as a clinic. Mm -hmm. It's a f service that I'm, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship. Yep. Yeah. Hey, as long as the cards are on the table and say, yeah. Hey, as I do a great job and have integrity and work with your patients and recommend putting them on a product with value-based care instead yeah. of fee-for-service. And I and I put somebody off of traditional fee-for-service and I move them on to an Advantage plan because I checked their meds and I checked access to care and I checked all these things. And it's not going to disrupt where or how you're accessing care, but now it's not just fee-for-service and this doctor can be incentivized to deliver better care. The, the patient's winning. And I'm going, and candidly, yeah. when I do that, I get paid a commission for doing that. And the, yeah. the doctor is going, but hey, I can now spend more time with this patient instead of just kicking them out through the door and having to fee for service and build somebody else. You know? Yeah. So and so it's, it's, it's taking that burden off the clinic to have to answer those Medicare questions. They maybe not even know anyway, right? Yeah. It's just anyway, and you have those, those office hours and things you can be in the clinic and, and again, remove that burden and add that value add. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, we, we really appreciate it. And, and candidly, we were, again, we were excited to have you both on the podcast. You're both, very busy, very busy, very successful people. And again, we think it's a really valuable kind of the message out there to the insurance broker community. Yeah. And thank you for, you know, becoming a doctor. We need more good doctors <laughs> these days. Thank you. you know, shout out to all my daughters in, in nursing school right now, oh, really? in advanced yeah, nursing awesome. school. And Absolutely. it's fun hearing her on her classes and the zoom and what they're learning and, you know, going through that on a, on a less intense level, you know? So yeah. Appreciate we, you. we need good nurses too. Absolutely. We do. We, yep. yep. Good for her. Thank you very much, Skylar. Thank you for having us. Thanks, guys. Thank Appreciate you, you. Thank you. Yep.